our economy is changing. The way our currency is being used and treated around the world is changing. Our national debt is changing. All of these are massive macroeconomic variables that will ultimately impact the future performance of the stock market in some way, in ways that we can't know for sure because we've never experienced anything like them. Allow me to explain in more detail. Welcome back, you super savvy 18,000 subscribers. In our last video on the subject, I shared with you the analogy of allowing my five-year-old to alter my cookie recipe. The results would be unpredictable. And if you happen to go 30 or 40 iterations of that without vomiting, that should in no way serve as a guarantee for you that this culinary experimentation will not make you throw up at some point in the future. Let's explore a couple of these market ingredients that will obviously change in the future and contemplate their vomit-inducing potential for our mainstream investment recipe. Consider briefly the following major economic phenomenon and how much of a variable it represents for our stock market projected return calculations. First, think about the life cycle of successful businesses. After going through a rapid and exciting growth phase, companies reach maturity, where things start to slow down quite a bit and ultimately decline. Ray Dalio posits a similar theory regarding the life cycle of a country or empire. Dalio is arguably the world's greatest macroeconomic visionary alive today. Over the last few decades, his insights have allowed his investment fund, Bridgewater Associates, to profit from unexpected economic shifts, both good and bad, all around the world. His success, derived from his dedicated research, has allowed Bridgewater to grow into the world's largest hedge fund. It's from this unique experience that Dalio has parsed together his research-backed theory. He breaks a country's life cycle into five, sometimes six stages. As we go through them, you should think through how they apply to many of those historical examples I provided in an earlier video in the series. Think Egypt, Rome, etc. And the first stage, countries are poor and think that they're poor. This stage makes up the early part of any established civilization. During this period, he says, they have very low incomes and most people have subsistence lifestyles. They don't waste money because they value it a lot and they don't have any debt to speak of because savings are short and nobody wants to lend to them. They're undeveloped. In the second stage, countries are getting rich quickly but still think they're poor. This stage is similar to the growth stage in a successful company's life cycle. Despite the growth, however, the people tend to, quote, behave pretty much the same as they did when they were in the prior stage. But because they have more money and still want to save, the amount of this saving and investment rises rapidly because they're typically the same people who experienced the more deprived conditions in the first stage. And because people who grew up with financial insecurity typically don't lose their financial cautiousness. They still work hard, save a lot, and invest efficiently in their means of production in real assets. Now in the third stage, countries are rich and think of themselves as rich. In the business world, this stage is known as, as maturity. When this happens to a country, Dalio says, the prevailing psychology changes from A, putting the emphasis on working and saving to protect oneself from the bad times, to B, easing up in order to savor the fruits of life. This change in the prevailing psychology occurs primarily because a new generation of people who did not experience the bad times replaces those who lived through them. Signs of this change in mindset are reflected in statistics that show reduced work hours. For example, typically there is a reduction in the average work week from six days to five, and big increases in expenditures on leisure and luxury goods relative to necessities. In the fourth stage, countries become poorer and still think of themselves as rich. He says this is the leveraging up phase, i.e. debts rise relative to incomes until they can't anymore. The psychological shift behind this leveraging up occurs because the people who lived through the first two stages have died off or become irrelevant. And those whose behavior matters most are used to living well and not worrying about the pain of not having enough money. Because the people in these countries earn and spend a lot, they become expensive. And because they are expensive, they experience slower real income growth rates. Since they are reluctant to constrain their spending in line with their reduced income growth rate, they lower their savings rates. 
increase their debts and cut corners. Because their spending continues to be strong, they continue to appear rich, even though their balance sheets deteriorate. They increasingly rely on their reputations rather than their competitiveness to fund their deficits. They typically spend a lot more money on the military at this stage, sometimes very large amounts because of wars, in order to protect their global interests. In the fifth stage, countries typically go through deleveraging and relative decline which they are slow to accept. As Dalio puts it, after bubbles burst and when deleveragings occur, private debt growth, private sector spending, asset values, and net worths decline in a self-reinforcing negative cycle. To compensate, government debt growth, government deficits, and central bank printing of money typically increase. In this way, their central banks and central governments cut real interest rates and increase nominal GDP growth so that it is comfortably above nominal interest rates in order to ease debt burdens. As a result of these low real interest rates, weak currencies, and poor economic conditions, their debt and equity assets are poor performing. And increasingly, these countries have to compete with less expensive countries that are in the earlier stages of development. Their currencies depreciate, and they like it. As an extension of these economic and financial trends, countries in this stage see their power in the world decline. Although the lengths of time associated with each of these stages differ for countries throughout history, the pattern has been relatively the same. This reality explains why our understandably optimistic experts from the historical scenarios that I took you through earlier in this series were ultimately proven dead wrong. The ancient Egyptian, Roman, Mongol, and, and British empires all experienced these periods during stages three and four when it would have been near impossible for anyone alive in that moment to sincerely imagine a time without their supremacy and without perpetual growth. But they all eventually, as civilizations always do, slipped into that fifth stage and began to decline. Into which stage do you think the United States and many other developed nations today fall? In which stage has the United States been during the majority of those 100 or so years of stock market data we've been relying upon, that everyone relies upon? Do you think a country's stock market returns should be expected to be similar during the various stages of their life cycle? Obviously, any market returns during the struggle of the first stage would be very different than those experienced during the prosperity of the third. But what about from the tail end of the fourth stage and beyond, when a country's growth slows? Is it still reasonable to expect the same market trajectory as we realized during prior stages? Remember Lowenstein's question from the very first video in the series? How do we know that the next new period won't change the story again? It almost certainly will. And what about this one? What about our reserve currency status? What kind of impact do you suppose having the US dollar as the world reserve currency has had on the performance of the US stock market over the last 90 plus years. History suggests the US dollar will not always maintain this position. And as difficult as that may be for some people to even imagine, we're increasingly seeing moves in that direction as countries and international organizations hold less and less USD in reserves. Yet this is the only reality we've known throughout our entire sampling of S&P 500 historical data. How could losing this status in the not too distant future impact our expected market returns going forward? Honestly, I don't claim to know. I don't think we can know. That's precisely the point. This is not a variable for which our past data accounts. My goal is not to pontificate on precisely what might happen as these massive variables change. Rather, it's to help you see that there's no reason to believe that they won't change. And when you have such large variables changing like this, as would be the case with any science experiment, it is illogical to expect similar results to what we've experienced in the past, given these new and entirely different market conditions. Finally, let's consider in more detail one of these worrisome macroeconomic variables that we've never had to account for in quite the same way. It's in that same vein of concern Buffett presented in an earlier video in this series, the national debt. Our global central banking policy crisis, i.e. developed nations just printing as much money as they'd like, is out of control. More and more countries are printing more, spending more, and racking up more debt than ever before. I, I could go on listing off countless ways the market is different today than it ever has been at any point in the past, but I know you get the point at this point. 
we have never been here before. So why do we pretend to know how everything will play out over the long run? The stock market may continue to go up at the same rate that it has or a similar rate that it has throughout your lifetime. It may not. The circumstances in which we find ourselves today are unlike anything we've ever experienced. I don't claim to know exactly how all of this will shake out, but there has to be a reckoning at some point. It's hard for me to imagine that not happening during my lifetime, but of course, I couldn't tell you. No one can. It's dangerous to doubt the financial wizardry and machinations of the powers that be and their ability to kick the proverbial can down the road for future generations. But whenever that reckoning does come, it's difficult for me to see a non-painful way out of this. Trying to understand how our stock market will perform after a global central banking crisis induced panic based on how it recovered after the panic of 1907, for example, is ludicrous. And even if it's not this unique global debt crisis that sets off a bear market like we've never before seen, there's always the possibility that something else could. Think the out of nowhere nature of COVID-19, for example, but worse. The economic chaos that ensued in March 2020 could not have been anticipated. It blindsided most investors. Who knows what could break this couple hundred year trend in a long lasting way. Don't get me wrong, I'm not predicting a worse than ever before crash here. The point is, you can't use historical data, no matter how much you have, especially when the inputs are also different, to predict what will happen forever into the future. The claim that the market always trends upward after major downturns seems a bit unqualified, with only 33 or so data points pulled from very different, read, non-controlled environments. But this is what we as humans tend to do. We want shortcuts, we want heuristics, we want things to be easy. So in the absence of sufficient data, we guess, we hypothesize, which in and of itself would be fine, except the industry is not treating modern portfolio theory, this buy and hold strategy, as the educated guess that it is. They're treating the theory as fact, as though it's been conclusively proven. As such, it's become financial doctrine. When in reality, it is just a guess. Daniel J. Borston said, the greatest enemy of knowledge is not ignorance. It is the illusion of knowledge. It is at least within the reasonable realm of possibility that for those who are relying on the past to predict forever into the future, investing according to modern portfolio theory with their buy and hold, stock and bond only, head in the sand portfolios, that a time will come when they will be financially devastated. That can be a difficult pill to swallow, I, I get it. It means you'll need to take more responsibility for the way you're investing, which means more stress, more concern. That's a hard reality, I understand. I'm not selling sunshine and rainbows here. That'd be so much easier. And although it may sound this way now, this isn't a message of, of fear. That's, that's not the point either. Instead, it's a message of, practicality, of being aware of what's possible, of, of not being blindsided, of being prepared no matter what happens. I'm not predicting a near-term loss of global superpower status for the United States, or the downfall of the European Union after a worldwide currency crisis, or that due to our country's life cycle stage that it'd be impossible for the stock market to average anywhere near as much over the next couple of decades. But I know for a fact that each of those, along with countless other scary scenarios, is a real possibility. When some people hear this message, they immediately write it off, interpreting it as me suggesting a total economic meltdown, utter chaos, the actual doomsayer scenario, that the stock market is no more, that all businesses go bankrupt, that the country is literally on fire. That is not, in fact, what I'm saying. The reason I spend so much time helping you understand and accept these possibilities is that once you do, you open yourself up to the reality of any future outcome in between. Sure, may maybe uh, higher than ever before, 30 year period of growth for the stock market is possible. It is, but given everything we just looked at, that hardly seems as likely as the possibilities in the other direction. Not to mention the fact that that wouldn't be a scenario for which you really need to be prepared. If that happens, yay, throw a party. But if the range of possibilities for our market investments also includes many average returns below, sometimes far below, those presented by mainstream financial experts, we might not want to invest quite so much of our life savings according to those mainstream strategies. 
you see the alternatives to the stock market averaging between 7% and 12% over the next 30 years is not the market totally imploding and everyone losing all their money, you know, 100% decline. No, it's the stock market averaging an effective, say 0% per year over the next 20 years leading up to your planned retirement. 2% per year for the rest of your life, an annualized 1% loss throughout your retirement, and so on. When you realize that there is a very real possibility, even if you view it as slim, of some of those crazy things happening, you realize that all the rates of return in between are also all very real possibilities. All things considered, some of them are not even that difficult to imagine, even if they have never happened before. And these are possibilities for which we can absolutely prepare. It's even possible to do so without sacrificing upside potential. Uh, plus, preparing for them comes with the added benefit that if those extremist doomsayer scenarios actually become reality, well, you'll just so happen to be in a position with much less downside risk. You'll be ready. So I hope you'll stick around because that's kind of my life goal now, to relentlessly find the absolute best ways for people to overcome these issues, allowing them to invest so much smarter and to create resources for you as I do, like, like this. If you missed any of the videos from this series, fully vetting out myth 10 of stop investing like they tell you, here's the full playlist for you. I so look forward to seeing you around. I wish you all the best. Take care.